I think this is an interesting thing you guys are talking about. You guys have a very, very tactical kind of more, you know, within a game world and actual TV space. Where I feel like um, with 360 video, it's a lot more accessible if you're just a content creator that just wants to stitch together video and create an experience. Um, I just feel like it's it's a very it's very simple to create a very easy linear experience, um, especially with the social media tools that are available right now. Yeah, I mean, and that's and, and I mean we that's the majority of what my company does is 360 degree video production. Um, this is a interior point. I mean, the tools are fairly easy. Um, this is a three hundred fifty dollar camera. It shoots high definition. Um, it does a great job of uh, taking three hundred sixty degree photos, and I can control it with my iPhone. I can edit the the footage inside of iMovie. We can have it on Facebook before we leave this room. Um, so if you want to experiment and you want to start to play in this space, you can get into it for very. Um, there's very there is kind of a low barrier to entry, um, and so yeah, I think that that's. And one reason why there's been such exponential growth with 360 videos in particular is because Facebook has invested a significant amount of dollars, uh, over two billion, um, to acquire Oculus. And their focus originally was to really focus on video and social aspects of VR. So 360 videos playing a big part into that. I would like to kind of see some of this stuff, um, and, and we've got the bit.ly up here, and I'd like to kind of go through each project. I mean, we don't have to go through every single second of it, but just so, so people get a sense of what we're talking about, if you press that, that bit.ly link, and if you have it at your um, devices, um, maybe we could go, Ricky, is there one of those? Yeah, we could, uh, do the, the cat factory one, so that's, got a, that's a good case. case. So, if uh, any of you guys are familiar, um, Capital Factory is uh, it's a big. Hi, welcome to Capital Factory. Awesome center. That's not that super horrendous. Um, so I know it, it doesn't normally sound like that. I promise. <laughs> okay, so Capital Factory is a is a big uh, entrepreneurial co-working space in Austin. Um, it is one of the largest. Up there, it kind of it's arguably probably responsible for the big uh, entrepreneurial uh, kind of vibe that is existence in Austin. Um, this is started by a gentleman named Josh Bear. He's done a lot of really good things for the Austin community. So what they were looking for is, is there's a, a quite a bit of uh, this is a good case kind of study for us um, about proving ROI, return on investment for a company like Capital Factory. There's if you guys are familiar with stuff like WeWork. Um, or tech space. These are a lot of these entrepreneurial co-working spaces or when you know you go and start your company and you realize that office space in downtown locations is incredibly expensive. You can get into these uh, types of places and have secretaries, uh, you know, free snacks, conference rooms to try and impress folks, um, snacks, sometimes free beer, uh, and you can get into them for starting a few hundred bucks a month. So they're a great, great kind of uh, tool um, for folks. So what they were looking to do, Capital Factory was, uh, was trying to kind of set themselves apart um, from other entrepreneurial co-working spaces in town. And if you follow that Bitly link and see someone right here moving her phone around, this was designed to be distributed on Facebook for mobile users. So the best way to watch this video is to watch it on your mobile device because you can actually interact with the video. Um, but we can do some click and dragging to show you what this uh, project um, looks like. And so this, this garnered about uh, like 30, almost 30,000 views in the first four days. Um, and those were all hyper-targeted to uh, Austin um, and their uh, demographic. So, and if you go to that little gear down in the right-hand corner, you might be able to get that bad boy. Oh, it's already all the way up. So, crank it up. So. And you can still hear me over the video, right? Some of the idea here was we wanted to show off the, the co working space. Welcome to Capital Factory, Austin Center of Gravity for Entrepreneurs. Located in the heart of downtown Austin, Capital Factory has 55,000 square feet that was home to hundreds of companies and hosts almost 1,000 events every year. Last year, 50,000 programmers and entrepreneurs gathered right here for meetups, classes, and hackathons. Even President Barack Obama stopped by. Years, all of our visitors and visitors can easily access our classroom, main event space, co-working area, private desks, and kitchen. Let's go check it out. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the tricky things about 360 videos. You never know where the person's going to look. Our main event space is the largest co-working area. So if you can try and encourage, you know, a certain movement uh, inside the video, um, encouraging transitions. 
things like that. It's also yeah, yeah, things that are recorded yeah. 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 so that engineer your content so that they intentionally are following you speaking or, That's right. or what you want to put in front of them. That's right. You know, so like if you want to transition, you make sure your transition goes to a different scene with what you want them to see right in front of them. You don't want it to transition with your content behind them and then they have to spin around in their chair and try to find it, you know. And so, so we can we'll give you an example real quick. Uh, oh, did I place a donut and chocolate milk in this video? Uh, <laughs> okay, that wasn't I didn't really need to show you all that but Okay, so I'm just going to give up, just gonna try and prove to his point that this is a, this is one of the interesting things that you can play with in 360 that's never really been available before. All of a sudden, you're giving the power of the camera operator to the audience, um, which you could do this with a little $300 Rico camera, which you have on the table right there too. So this is like the big reveal of Josh, who's the founder of this class. Paying it forward with advice, introductions, and they can even engage on this. You can even sign up for office hours with our founder, Joshua Bear. Here you have. You know, the kitchen's my favorite part of Apple Factory. Again, right, just encouraging the users, like, oh, here he is now. Who's here now? And, you know, to, to try and use the medium. So I think that's one of the important things with, uh, with 360 video, is that when we use it, because it is a new medium, that we use it properly. And it's, it's, we have to consider it, it's different than filming something on that iPad back there, or on your phone, or on a camera. It's a totally different new medium, and we have to start to think about new ways to use it um, and that, that is something that we try to do on every project. So if you mentioned that at this time you can't move a 3D camera as it's filming? So you, you can move the camera. What you can't do is, if you want to get up from this table in the video and go sit with that gentleman back there against the glass, you can't do that inside the video. So then my follow-up, that would be the, the mixed uh, reality that you were talking about? Yes. So how far of a reality, like, I guess, how close are we? To that just being like that level of photorealism and immersion in like day-to-day -day video games. Um, a, a long ways. So there's there's try not to try not to keep this you know get this too technical, but there are things called uh, light field cameras, um, which are going to be the next evolution of this, um, and they they basically capture light from all directions. So they're capturing light bouncing off of things, and what you can do is you can actually move inside of film scenes if it's done with a light field camera. However, from my understanding, the rendering power that's required on these cameras um, is like the, the processing computers are literally like the size of a small house. Um, they're massive. And so it's, it's not really within reach. Um, our video, this video here, was rendered out at 8K resolution. Um, and so even that, like I had to, we had to build custom computers with a graphics card that was only four days old from NVIDIA um, that allowed us to even be able to like render this out and play it back without it lagging. Um, and, and this is 8K, you know, I think what they claim is photorealistic human eye can, is going to be like 32 or 64K. So imagine, you know, whatever that, I don't know what the math is on that, but 35, 4K TV, that much resolution. I feel like they're getting pretty close with photogrammetry though. Like, yeah, what, they are. We're basic, they're basically scanning a space through high resolution digital SLR photos and then basically texturing the 3D rendering of that space with those photos. So um, there's a couple experiences on the Vive. I don't remember exactly the name of it, but there's one where you're like in the Netherlands in the mountains, and very quickly you kind of forget that you're in this headset, and it becomes very real. Um, a lot of the people are calling these things empathy machines, so it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to get that emotion so that they feel like they're there, you know? Um, you'd be surprised at how low resolution will fall in the back of your mind, but it's so much more awesome whenever, you know, whenever you're not seeing pixels and stuff, and stitching with the stitch lines and stuff like that. Um, to, your, to, your, to your question though, I think, are we as, um, when is the like Adobe Premiere, kind of that easy workflow um, for 360 video VR experiences, photogrammetry, all of that going to exist? I don't know. Uh, we all, all of us, I think here, correct if I'm wrong, but we're all using custom solutions. Um, this is a selfie stick, and this is a piece of plexiglass, and this is a 360 camera, and the reason that I built this is because there is no tripods made for 360 cameras yet. Because um, if you take a picture of the regular tripod, like the one in the middle of the room, you look down at the picture and you're like, oh, what's this big ugly tripod? I want to see the floor. 
Uh, and so, again, the point of all that is that it, a lot of this is all custom, being custom built, custom done, custom designed today. Um, so. And just to act as a counterpoint to Ricky's statement, yeah. since he uh, was saying that it's a, a long ways off before that technology exists, my opinion is it's not very far off. Uh, I've been involved in the games industry for almost 20 years now, and I think um, within, yeah, five years, right. within five years we'll, we'll have a solution to record. I mean, currently the technology exists. Um, where, the, where the ceiling is hit is that the hardware is not fast enough. And the file size is because for light field recordings, you're taking literally for every frame of a light field animation, you're, you're producing tens of thousands of images. That's how it literally works, is that it's pre-rendered or recorded a specific viewpoint in a, in a volume, in a zone. So you can move around that zone and it's already recorded that. But the, the, counters, the counter to that is that it's a massive terabytes and terabytes of, of data uh, per second. But that's simply, you know, simply a hardware technology, you know, combination. It's, we already know how to record the data. It's just a matter of producing it, uh, you know, repeatedly uh, for somebody to view on a, a regular consumer hardware. Like, even just like live streaming, 360, you know, that's a lot of data, you know, and we're, we're receiving, like, it's hard to even get on the wireless in the room because there's so many people right now on the wireless. So, you know, there are lots of uses for this stuff, but there's a lot of data being transferred. So that helps us like, getting right faster exponentially. Yeah. You know, um, and stuff. I mean, I got a free flash card or like a, a, a USB keychain. It was a 64 gigabyte keychain. I mean, five years ago, those were like $180. And someone gave it to me for free as like a gift. It's big. So. Yeah, that's part of the frustrating thing with the 360 video stuff. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll shoot something and, you know, I put the render stuff out in like 12K, but I'm forced to put it on a web on a web platform that's only going to support 4K. You know, so that resolution just instantly gone. You know. I would like to get to uh, Nicole and Nick's uh, project. Uh, maybe that's the next one we could look at. Um, that was for AdAge, right? Um, yes. Yeah, and so this involved, it looked like there were some animations that were also involved with it. So um, I think you might have to turn this one down for a little bit. So I'm not going to play with it. Yeah, I don't need to play with it. But yeah, so it's kind of like using, it looks like a flat, you know, flat script right now, but as you move around, it's actually, you know, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's very interesting to know because. There are a lot of elements, as you can see, I and mean, you can start finding the animation. Talk a little bit about what it is first. Oh, like, of course. Yeah. So what this was, we, their, Adage had a cover contest designed their cover for the Cannes, uh, Cannes uh, Advertising Festival of, Creat Festival of Creativity, mm -hmm. uh, with the prompt being creativity. So, you know, they had a lot of entries, all very awesome. But what we decided to do is that we wanted to reach outside of the 2D element and bring in the future of the app, the 360 element, while it was pretty much in its prime. Do you guys want to, real quick, even because I'm curious, two minutes if, if that, and how, how did you actually make it? Can you walk us through like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, we can actually watch it and, and walk us through. Um, but what it is is that, you know, you have the cover and there's a QR code, and you just use your QR code and it links you to this. And it best works on your mobile, it looks great on mobile. You move, you move it around and do whatever you want. So let's just play and check it out. So um, what we use, we use the Adobe Suite, we use Photoshop, After Effects, um, and this third party, you can, you can just move it around a little bit to show them. We use this third party plugin called uh, Skybox Metal. And Similar to the way that these guys work, it splits up six cameras in a 360 view and then splices them all together into one video. So, as you can see, if you can turn all the way around, you can see the stuff kind of is very uh, far right now. <laughs> turn, turn back around and just end that. There we go. Okay, so you can see a little bit of the what kind of going through. I mean, it, it is 2D, it is a little limited, but if you look around here, you can see. Some stuff, uh, <laughs> if you want. Yeah. Uh, what we also did with this actually is we, uh, since we tried to combine a lot of different mediums, 
we actually used the cover to build a uh, VR viewer, which was really fun. Um, it, it actually took a really long time to get the, the distance right. So if you, if you don't want your phone like this close to your face because it just blurs everything. So we had to make sure that we could build in enough room for you to actually get a good, like not too blurry look at the video while also not obviously expanding further than the page that uh, that we have. And, and uh, like Paul said, they, we debated a lot about using QR codes, but those are available for everybody, and everybody knows what QR codes are. Uh, but yeah, once you put the, uh, the cover together and scan that, we can then put it in, and it was built for like a, <laughs> it, it, it was, yeah, it was built for the like iPhone 6, uh, since it's generally the phone that people have, and it'd be easier for, I guess, panel judges to put their phones into it. Uh, and, and then they, uh, just, well, they put it together, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so what, what we didn't explain was that part of the cover was actually a VR viewer. So you could cut it out, put it together, and then snap the QR code, put your phone inside the viewer, and look, move it around. It acted more as like a theater device. It didn't have you know little holes and magnified and kind of like little cardboard, but I mean it was fun. It was interactive. The people at I said they, they said the first thing they did when they saw our cover is they cut it up into pieces, and you know it became an interactive, fun. Arts and crafts type people, you know, uh, and got them very excited about this kind of new medium. Um, we're on an interesting spectrum of this panel because these guys kind of know a lot. You know, these guys are very, uh, you know, very detailed knowledge, and we kind of just sort of jumped into it. You know, it was it was it was a learning experience and definitely a very rewarding experience in the end. Yeah, it's funny because probably none of you were really into this stuff two years ago, a year ago. You know, it's, it's very new, and that's what's very exciting about it is um, nobody wrote a book on this stuff. You know, there's no, we're trying to develop classes for it because, you know, people get into space and have to learn on their own. I know I'm experimenting all the time, but it's, I think this kind of this uh, MO in the, in the uh, digital world that you have to continually learn. You can't be trained for a job for a week and then go work it for 30 years. You know, it's a constant state of learning and you know, finding new ways to hack your way through this kind of stuff. Um, is that true? Yeah. Don't yeah. be scared. Just get out there and do it. Grab yeah. all your friends' GoPros, tape them all together in a ball. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it in the river. You hope for the best. This thing, you better hand for a bit. What's up, man?
clients just come up, um, and sometimes you work some long hours. And what happened was, what client I was working on, we were working on the sponsorship, and we were trying to um, figure out how to make some social media posts for them. And it was maybe three or so in the morning, and it's like, let's just do a 360 video, because that's something that's new that we've seen, and it could be really fun. Um, to create a video, the content they had was a little bit spooky, so we thought it'd be a really fun way to create a, uh, a new type of video that's kind of spooky, since everybody just wants to look around and things can sort of pop out, pop, pop up out at you. And so it's yeah, it three in the morning, maybe in, in February, and then uh, since Nicole was the, the after effects person at the agency, um, Pretty much it. I was like, hey Nicole, there's a project we're gonna need you for, and and I guess did for her is the day after my 3 a.m. <laughs> That's actually a very interesting thing to bring up because it's exactly what they said. We got thrown into this, and not like I don't regret anything because this is awesome and we learned so much. But I remember we were like staying up so late trying to come up with something, and our creative. Uh, so our creative technologist, I guess, at the agency, he comes to my desk and says, hey, do you want to learn how to make 360 video? And within maybe 10 minutes, <laughs> I had the tools to make my own 360 video. So, um, and now I've done what, maybe about four or five videos for the client. Um, yeah, so it's extremely experimental. It's extremely, I mean, staying up late trying to figure out exactly how the heck this stuff works. The, the rendering, you know, as I said earlier, my god, like, if you don't have a computer book for this thing, <laughs> you better watch out, so. <coughs> I'd like to hear what you guys think of, like, what's the future of this stuff? Is this a fad that's going to kind of fly by night, you know, or is this going to be like the next big thing, or is this going to be just a niche, like, market? Like, where is this going to fit that you see in the next five, ten, Years. I think this is a prototype. I think a part of me feels that, you know, 360 maybe not be as popular. Like it's kind of like a some kind of, yeah, it does seem like a phase, like a teenager phase, but I feel like it's going to kind of go into adulthood, maybe merge more with uh, more interactive mediums and become something entirely kind of, kind of like Pokemon evolve. <laughs> so. I, I guess I probably agree. I think it's all, I think it's all a stepping stone to augmented reality. Um, you know, think about Tom Cruise's film Minority Report, when he's computing and augmented reality, right? He's dragging things and, and all of that. I think that's where this is all going. Um, but I believe, personally, that this is all a uh, stepping stone to training the consumer on how to uh, interact with media in a whole new way. Um, because it took a long time to, you know, I remember 20, 15 years ago, however long ago, when you know, I was taught in school, I was one of the first kids in my school to have a keyboarding class. And we were all like, ugh, keyboarding, what is this? This is stupid, I'll never need this. And now it's like, wait, you got taught how to keyboard? It's like, yeah, they taught us how to do that, right? And it was the same thing with mobile devices, right? I mean, 15, 20 years ago, um, you know, my, my dad, for instance, was, he had a technology company. Um, and, and he was, you know, fixing computers and typewriters and printers. And he was like, oh, cell phones, what, why do I need a cell phone? And now he runs his entire company off of his cell phone. And, but we have to train consumers on how to use and how to interact with new technologies. And I think that interactive media, photography, 360 video, et cetera, is, and even virtual reality, is a way, is a stepping stone on how we are going to teach the next uh, level of consumer on how to interact with media in a whole new way. Because if we were to give someone a very, very advanced pair of like, um, augmented reality contact lenses tomorrow, I don't think we would understand how to use it best. We wouldn't understand how that technology interacts with the world as it, as it should. Um, it's an evolution. And so I think this is a stepping stone on that world of evolution, right? We started with our media way, way out in front of us, and it's gotten closer, and now it's here, and now it's going to go here, and then it's going to go even closer, and it'll just be an overlay over our reality. Um, and so, anyway. Well, I mean, I've been seeing, you know, this sort of buzz created by virtual reality for several years. I think the first demo that I got of VR was at the American Film Institute about 15 years ago. They ran it off of a 
huge silicon graphics, military grade onyx station, uh, and it was just a really blocky uh, kitchen that, that uh, updated like once every 10 seconds, and the thing weighed about 300 pounds that you put on your head. But you know, we've we've gone through several iterations where it's built up momentum, and then the technology hasn't been been there quite quite ready for it. And I think that one thing that's different about the VR of today is that finally that technology has caught up to the dream, to the realization of that. And you have major companies getting behind it where, you know, for the first time in history, you have Sony and Samsung and Facebook and Google and all these multi-billion dollar companies putting significant investments behind it. And it's because that they see the potential of it. So even though right now the marketplace might not fully exist or be matured, uh, these companies are betting heavily that there will be a market in not just entertainment, but also in education, research, you know, multiple verticals. And that's what's really different this time around with virtual reality in the past. And, and I think too that there'll be, there will always be kind of from here on out, I think there will always be uh, times when 360 video or 360 photo is the best medium. I think there'll be times when virtual reality works the best. Um, there's some really amazing studies coming out around like PTSD and pain tolerance and um, all sorts of different psychological things where blocking out the entire world is the best way to experience that. Um, but I, I think that in the long run, even though those technologies will have their place, um, I think it's all a gateway to augmented, uh, high level augmented reality. Yeah. I, I think I agree with definitely with everything that everybody's saying. It's, I think we're just barely scratching the surface and it will definitely evolve into something else. Since you mentioned earlier, uh, with true VR, where you're fully immersed in the environments, there can be some problems with nausea and everything, but those are little things that will be worked out over time. And with VR right now, the true, like, immersive kind of videos, it's, that, I'd say that's very niche, since you have to have the equipment to actually do that. And what we can do with Facebook and YouTube, it's very easy to just pop into those videos really quick. And unfortunately, you can also leave them very quickly as well. But uh, it's, it's a way that we can start moving towards this area. Uh, and I think another thing we need to work on is virtual reality in itself is not a very, I guess, social thing, because you're mentioning you kind of go into this world and you lock yourself off from everybody. So if we can move more into a social space with VR in, in 360, I think it would be in a very nice nice area. Which I think it is, right? Yeah. Uh, ultimately, this is great to get into my theory of like, where it's all going is when we're no longer wearing headsets, we no longer go in a dark room and put on this headset, is when I can have it right here, you know? I put on a pair of glasses, not Google glasses, but, you know, <laughs> um, but you know, when, when you can have these um, mixed reality, augmented reality, when they can interact in the real world with you and you can talk to, you know, whether it's a character, maybe it's a uh, study assistant, you know, maybe it's a, you know, whatever it is, um, whenever, Whenever it's seamless and it, and, it, and it doesn't break your immersion, that's when, uh, I mean, that, that's my biggest issue there. You know, that's actually like, that. And I think too, there's a lot of people that, that will argue that VR is just a, uh, a fad because there is no social, um, there, it has no social ability, um, which I would argue that because if you've, if you've tried any of the social VR experiences, um, I watched a comedy show in VR and it was, clunky and it was bad and it crashed and all you saw were these weird floating avatars. I thought, I took this thing off until the phone, this is just a Samsung phone in here. I wore this until the phone overheated and crashed. I thought it had been like 20 minutes. It had been two hours and I had, well, I like came out of VR on the other side of my apartment. And like, I had a hell of a time. Like, and it was, it was just a social interaction. It was a, a Wednesday night, I was stuck in my apartment, just to do whatever, but no, I was in a New York comedy club with a bunch of other people from around the world having conversations, laughing at jokes, making jokes, um, you know, whatever it was, and it was an incredibly powerful thing. Um, and I think that, that that's gonna be a big part of VR um, when it gets there. That's that taste. And that's, that's the big question, is when does it get there? That's just that taste of it being, yeah. you know, in your mind. Yeah. yeah. We've got a question back here, go ahead. Do you think the rise of uh, VR and AR and mixed reality are going to render 2D screens um, obsolete completely? No. Never? No. 
the end of a long day, and you want to go home and like veg out on the couch with your significant other and watch a movie and like curl up in a blanket and like not really pay attention, but kind of pay attention and like have that experience or like yell at the TV when your team's getting smoked on a Sunday, right, in football season. Like that is an experience where we're, I think we're always going to want kind of a 2D thing. Like, those are basic experience. Um, I don't know. I think this, I, I, don't know. I don't think it's going away completely. At least not. It's it's more just a new medium that can't be paralleled by a medium that's come before it. I mean, right. I'm looking around this auditorium. Even though I would guess that almost every one of you have a cell phone capable of taking notes, a lot of you have pen and paper just because it does that more efficiently and it's a more interactive sort of you know tool for that specific thing so i think that for a use case there's always going to be tablets and always going to be screened because they do something specifically better than you know can be done by augmented reality and the eagles just sound so much better <laughs> <laughs> um i would like to definitely want to get you guys uh, to ask questions so if you have any um i think what i might do is grab a uh, mic from y'all and I know we only have so many anyway. Um, and just kind of let you guys form a line in the back there. Um, if you have a specific question, just get that line going. We'll get you in line. Uh, why don't you guys come up? These guys will be here for a little bit to answer questions that you guys have. Um, let's give them a round of applause.